Well, good evening. Congratulations. We've made it. Surely we're going to get through this one together, and that'll be the conclusion of our time together for the Beyond the Hevel, the study in Ecclesiastes. Throughout the course of the quarter, I have subjected you to story and illustration time and time again that have revolved around my children. And usually, those illustrations, I've known that if they were relatable to you, you would relate to them through the eyes of a parent or the eyes of a grandparent or maybe the eyes of an aunt or uncle or something along those lines. So I want you to know that tonight we will continue down that path. That's still going to be the case. But the story I want to tell you quickly tonight, I believe, is one that for the first time, I hope you, or I don't hope you do, but I think you will relate to my three-year-old on a one-on-one personal level through her eyes. Sunday evening after Bible class, we were headed home. And somewhere along our commute, Savannah and I started discussing Bible class. Probably we had asked the girls how theirs was. This one came up, and I made the statement to Savannah, well, just one Bible class left to go. And from the back seat, I hear this bubbly voice, and Kava says, Dad, you only have one Bible class left? So yeah, babe, just one. She said, yes, I'm so excited. So if that's you tonight, congratulations, you made it. But in all seriousness, before we get into the text, before we get into the conclusion that we're going to see for the book of Ecclesiastes, I do want to say just a couple of things quickly to you. First of all, I want to thank you all for your kind attention during the quarter. And if it wasn't true attention, congratulations and kudos on the facade that you put up. Because from my point of view, that's the way that it looked and that's the way that it seemed. And if you've ever had to speak to a group of people, whether that's five people or 500 people, you know that it's exponentially easier when the group that you're speaking to is attentive. So I earnestly thank you for that. And then, as we have mentioned a couple other times, just one last time, I want to thank you for your participation during class. And I want to thank you for the feedback that you gave me outside of class, because I think those things really served a twofold purpose. They enhanced the discussion in this room about what we're studying for everyone involved. And I know that they had great benefit to me individually. And then lastly, I just want you to know that my hope is that through the course of our study and discussion together, through the course of our looking at the words of the preacher, we, have, we will all be able to take away something that when the hevel in this life enters into our realm, that we will be able to more easily navigate it. And so I hope that is going to be the case for all of us. Now tonight, as I said, we're in the conclusion of the book. We are at the point of Ecclesiastes where there is going to be a bow tied on everything that has been said thus far. And whether you're like me and you think the book opens with a sentence by the author who then recounts the story of the preacher and then switches back to himself here in the last five verses, or if you believe the preacher wrote both portions of that from the first and the third person, what really matters, and we all know, is that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's the Word of God. And so we're going to get the conclusion to Ecclesiastes tonight that the Holy Spirit has put in place. And it's really an exclamation point on the book. This conclusion serves to make sure that somehow, while reading these 12 chapters, based on the thought experiment of this preacher figure, that we haven't missed the fact that life is outside of our control, and that it's gift from God, not gain, and that we are to use our mortality to figure out how to navigate through it. And so that's what we're going to look at together tonight. But as we always do, let's go to God in prayer before we get started. Father, we come to you tonight thankful for all the great things that you do for us, for the many, many blessings that you provide us on a daily basis. We thank you for the ability to gather together and study your word tonight. We thank you for the quarter of study that we've had together. 
And I thank you for the group of people who are here that are invested in studying your word and living in your word and applying your, your word to their lives. Father, please be with those of our number who need the comfort and healing that only you can provide. And I'll, as always, Father, mostly we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay. I was looking for the clicker. It was in my pocket. It's a great place to hide it. Let's look at the text together here. Chapter 12, starting in verse 9. I don't know how well you can see it, but there are some words in this passage that I have underlined and emboldened on the screen. And as we read through it, I want you to pay attention particularly to those words. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So there we have it. That's our conclusion. That is the bow being tied on Ecclesiastes. That's the exclamation point that we talked about. And in a few moments, we're going to highlight four things that in my mind this section of text points out about the book of Ecclesiastes that we are not to miss. But before we get into that, I want to take a look at the concept that I think is being played out here on a more broader sense. And that's the highlighting of the idea of words. The words that we see here where it talks about he also taught the people, presumably with words, arranging many proverbs, again, through words. And then it says we sought to find words of delight and words of truth. The words of the wise, they're like collected sayings, when all has been heard and commandments. When we look at all of these things present in this passage, it brings my mind to the power of words and the many things that they can do. We have all undoubtedly heard it said that actions speak louder than words. And usually in the context that that statement is made, I believe that that is probably fitting in the case. But I do believe, however, that without words, without the power of words, our lives, our relationships, and our endeavors to an extent would be left lacking. They would be empty or barren to an extent. And that's because of the things that the power of words allow them to do. The first thing that I want us to look at is the truth is that words do things. So whether I'm sitting here and I'm in a setting like this and I'm speaking to a group of people studying God's word that I happen to be in front of, or if I'm at work and I'm figuring things out with my colleagues and my coworkers, or if you've somehow found yourself cornered by me and we're talking about grilling, reading on a Kindle, or pickleball, which if you find yourself cornered by me, there are probably a few people in here that will tell you that's exactly what you're going to talk about if I have my druthers. But in any of those instances, while I am speaking to you, I can see the power of my words in your face. I can see the emotion being born from the words that I am saying. Whether that is happiness or anger, joy or sorrow, understanding or confusion, oftentimes when words are spoken, the emotions that they bear come to light. But words also change things. 
They can do things, and they also change things or alter courses of action. So whether it's when Kava, I told you it was coming, whether it's when Kava is in the middle of her 15th wardrobe change between bedtime and dinner and just discarding the previous one on the floor, or Sloane is looking over her left and right shoulder as she opens the cabinet to get her second snack before dinner, if Savannah or I come in and say, stop, their course of action is altered. Now, admittedly, it may take more than just once, but usually by the second or third time, we're good to go. Words have the ability to change things that are already in action. Words also make things. They have a creative power to them at times. I think of a scene at a wedding where you have these two googly-eyed lovebirds standing at the altar. You know, the guy's jaw is about to hit the floor because he can't believe that this beautiful girl is going to marry him. She's standing there, an absolute train wreck of emotions. Could be because she thinks the same about him, or it could be because she's not too sure about that place setting at the reception. But either way, they're standing there in front of their friends, in front of their family, in front of God himself, and they're about to make a commitment to one another. They're about to, after being asked, do you take so-and-so to be your lawfully wedded husband or wife? And do you promise to do X, Y, and Z? They're going to say, I do. And when they say, I do, there's something there that is created. These words are bringing a binding agreement to enter into marriage, which is creating something very deep and very powerful. These words are not merely a comment on the state of marriage or the fact that they are accepting to be married, but they are, in fact, creating that pact. It's a promise in my mind, that is similar to the promise that we receive from God our Father. A promise that is a covenant, so to speak. The promise from Him, which is our salvation. And we mentioned earlier that actions speak louder to words. And that promise of salvation, without question, is based on action. It is based on the action that Jesus came and walked and lived a pure life and then was sacrificed for our sins. But nobody sitting here tonight, nobody that any of us have ever known, saw those actions take place. We all have belief and faith and trust in God because of his word that tells us it happened. And possibly because of the words of others who first told us that it happened. And when we allow them to, God's words will do things to us. They will change things in our life. They will create things within us because God's words, as we know, are the most powerful at all, of all. God spoke the world into existence. God opened his mouth and the universe was born. He created everything in the world around us down to the intricacies in our bodies that no one can even explain all by speaking them into existence. And just as God was speaking then, he speaks to us now, right? He speaks to us now through his living word, through the Bibles that we all have in our hands or in the pews in front of us. And since that's the case, he's also speaking to us through the book that we're reading in Ecclesiastes. And so if we are listening, as this conclusion of the chapter is telling us, if we are listening to all these different words that we are being given, all these different sayings, then those words will do the same thing on that list to us. And one last time, Ecclesiastes has reminded us that the primary sense organ of a Christian is in fact our ears. And the conclusion to this book will one more time be sure that we understand how his words work. In the last chapter, we were asked a question about timing. We were asked when to remember our Creator. As we all know, the answer to that question was in the days of our youth. And here we're going to receive the answer to two more questions. How do I remember my Creator? 
and why do I remember my Creator? Or maybe more succinctly, how and why? Should I live wisely in God's world? The verses that we are looking at explain how and why the preacher accomplished and did what he did with his words and the desired effect of those words, which he hopes they have on his audience, including ourselves. The fact that the preacher didn't conduct this massive thought experiment that we see here and then hermit himself away in the tower of his palace but he shared it with those around him. He spoke about it to those around him. In verse 9, it says he also taught the people knowledge. He shared with them to make them wise. He found that oftentimes, with words, little sayings or proverbs or things in poetic form, help show the complexity and challenges of life. And so he wrote them down. And he studied, as we've mentioned, everything under the sun, and his observations are recorded, recorded for us here. So this book concludes by pointing to four of those observations that he spoke about and wrote down for ourselves and for everyone of all time and what they mean for us. And so they each highlight things that we have seen laced throughout the text up until this point. And so for the remainder of our time tonight and our time together, we're going to look at those four things. It just so turns out they were perfect candidates for some alliteration so we're going to call them the four P's, and here they are. The first one is what words of pleasure we will see. The second one is the pain that can sometimes be brought to us through the words of the preacher and the words of the Bible. And then when we have those two things combined, we're going to see the perspective that should be born out of those two things acting in our lives. And then fourthly, we're going to see the preparation that that perspective should drive us to make. So we'll get into those now. Let's talk about the pleasure and then the pain, and then we'll kind of tie those together and finish up tonight. Firstly, with this idea of pleasure in the words, particularly for us in the book of Ecclesiastes, but in God's word as a whole as well. But in this book, Ecclesiastes, does it make you glad? Does it make you happy? Does it make you joyful, filled with comfort when we read it, especially now that we've made our way through it in its entirety? Or does it make you sad or maybe a little bit in a state of despair? Because as we have mentioned previously, it is a misfortunate truth. I'm not sure if misfortunate is actually a word. Maybe it's unfortunate. Either way, one of those. It's an unfortunate truth that oftentimes people, when they read Ecclesiastes, they read the words of the preacher and they interpret them to be negative and filled with gloom. And I think that we've seen throughout his text that that's not the case, but it's told to us pretty plainly again right here. Look at verse 10 with me, if you will. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. Or maybe we would say words of pleasure. And then at the same time, they were upright and true. So back to one of the questions that we're getting answered tonight. How do you know your creator? How do you know that you know God? I think the answer that we are seeing through this book is by listening to his words and seeing that we find them to be pleasurable. I hope that by this point in our study together, that has become an apparent fact to all of us. Because the fact is that God is not a grumpy old man in the way that he wants us to live in his creation. He has not been puritanical about the words that he gives us to describe himself. There's also a beautiful truth to the words of the preacher, to the words of God that are meant to fill us with pleasure. Oftentimes when people come to the Bible for the first time, they ask questions such as, is the Bible true? Can I trust what the Bible tells me? Is the Bible a reliable source of information? And I think that those things are important to have answered individually. I think that those things are a part of the bedrock that the foundation of our faith is built upon. 
But when it comes to God's Word being true, I think there's more to it than that. I think the actuality is that the Bible, God's Word, and then the words of the preacher in turn, they are beautiful because they're true. But interestingly enough, because it's, and then by being true, it is also beautiful. And when I think about that fact, that those two things go hand in hand in one another, it sometimes makes me kind of think sadly about those people in this world who don't believe in God or don't believe in the Bible, and they think it's foolish for anyone to do so. And when I think about that, I, my mind always goes back to a gentleman that I used to work with. And this, this guy was convinced that the, as he would put it, the truths of the Bible were not true at all, is what he would tell everyone, and then he would go on his little dissertation. And you could almost every time, without taking more than 15 seconds, point to exactly the passage that would dispel his notion, but he just did not want to believe it. And oftentimes, he himself and people like him, they will construct their own truths, and that these are the truths that they themselves have deemed true and imposed. But ultimately, every time those constructs fail, they always end up losing their footing and then crumble around the individual that has made them. And even usually, in that turmoil in their life, they're unwilling to realize that their truths can't be true because truth is not arbitrary in nature. Because truth comes from one spot in one spot only. And in the Bible, God has given us words of pleasure that tell us by the very way in which they are pleasurable what is true. And so what I mean by that is that much of the Bible works like that. I think back to this idea of a marriage, right? The Bible could tell us simply what a marriage is, who the participants in a marriage are, and the mechanics of how a marriage works. But it goes on to do so much more than that. Time and time again, we are shown through his word what truth and the beauty that lie in that truth actually look like. We don't have time to do it tonight. But if you'd like to see that point highlighted, just go read the Song of Solomon. If you read the Song of Solomon, you will see the beauty that your marriage is supposed to be, the pleasure of God's word. And the truth is that God's word cannot be separated from the beauty and pleasure that they provide. It's all part of the same package. Again, for the sake of time, we're not going to flip to these. But if you want to see that played out, you can go to Job and read chapters 38 through 41. Or you can go and read the 23rd Psalm or Isaiah chapter 40 or Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, or Revelation 21 and 22. If you'd like to see that, come to Don's class in here next quarter. We know our Creator when we realize the words He speaks, these words of delight that we see in verse 10, these words that are upright and true, when they bring you pleasure. These words are meant to fulfill us, to bring us satisfaction, to make us smile, to give us comfort. And peace. But however, there are at times when they can make us shudder or grimace or wince as well. At times, the words of the preacher in Ecclesiastes and in the Bible as a whole, they inflict a little bit of pain. Look at verse 11 with me. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. If you're unfamiliar with what a goad is, most of you probably know, it's simply a corrective tool. It is a wooden staff or stick, whatever you want to call it, with a nail embedded on one end with a sharp end pointed out. And they were typically used, I guess they still are, but in this day and time to keep sheep where they were supposed to be. It was a tool of correction used by a shepherd. They kept the animals on the desired path. If the sheep went to the left of the desired path, or if the sheep went to the right of the desired path, or if that sheep 
stopped moving down the desired path. He was going to meet the business end of the goad. And there was going to be pain involved with that that would then get the sheep back on its track. And that is the purpose of many of the words that we've seen here from the preacher. When we feel pain from these words that are nail-like, it is important for us to remember that they are from the one true shepherd, from God himself. Because the truth is, at times, we all get off course. And so to live in a right relationship with our Lord, we need prodding just like the sheep do. We need words that will stop you mid-step, just like telling Sloane to stop before she grabs her second snack, and will get you headed in the right direction. And so we've seen many different passages all throughout Ecclesiastes that do this in a host of different ways. And one of the main themes, as we've mentioned in the book, is to remember to frame your life through the fact that your death is coming, that we're not going to avoid it. So we see verses pointing to that all throughout it. For example, chapter 4 and verse 2, chapter 7 and verse 1, chapter 11 and verse 8. And so sometimes those words are, you are going to die, get things right. But other times they are, you're going to try to find gain through this pursuit and it's going to fail you. Or maybe you just don't know if it is or it isn't. Maybe they're going to tell you that while you should live wise, you need to quit putting wisdom at the top of your priority list. Maybe it's telling us that we need to not act foolishly because of all the downfalls that are there. But whatever the case may be, there are reminders all throughout the book that we need as the sheep that we are, right? When we know that we are sheep, and we can embrace the fact that we are going to have sheep-like problems, then these words that at times will bring pain will be doing their job, will be allowing them to do their job. From the very beginning, Adam and Eve were given a desired and good path to tread, and they veered off. Similarly, God, through his word, shows us the good and right path to tread, and we, at times, veer. So the word of God is at times going to be painful because we must remember our creator by letting his word permeate our heart, our mind, and our souls, knowing and living in his word is the only way to recognize that path that we are to be on, and when we are, in fact, off of it. We must, as well, protect the path that we are supposed to be on. We have to make sure that when we are being prodded by the Word of God, and it's bringing discomfort into our lives, that we don't then try to poke and prod it in return, and contort it to fit our desires. Sadly, we see that happen many, many times in the world around us. But simply, we cannot domesticate God's Word. Again, we are the sheep. We must allow it to poke and prod us instead of the other way around. We will know that we know God when at times what He says to us brings us to tears when it humbles us to our knees, when it reverses our expectations, it upsets our priorities, offends our behavior, or challenges our thinking. When the words of God do that to us and bring the pain that we've been talking about here, that's one way that we know that we are listening correctly to what he is telling us, to what the preacher has been telling us. Any comments or questions on this idea of words of pleasure and words of pain throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. All right, well, let's move on to the perspective that we're seeing here in the conclusion that we are supposed to draw. When we allow the words that are meant to be delightful and pleasurable, and when we allow the words that are supposed to poke and prod us to act on them the way that we are supposed to. There's a certain perspective that I think that we are supposed to come to 
as a um, part of that equation. The question is, why should we delight in God's Word and allow it to wound us at times? And I think verse 13 here has a lot of insight into that very question. In verse 13, it says, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The amazing thing to me about that verse is the sense of totality and comprehensiveness that fearing God and keep his commandments is supposed to be involved in our lives. Again, it says it's the whole duty. And I believe that this is representative of the perspective that we've been talking about throughout the entire quarter together, the perspective of beyond the hevel. This isn't, however, something that is always easy to do. Because at times, we have so much going on in our lives, whether it's work or friends or hobbies or any number of things, and we sort of compartmentalize them, right? We put everything in its own little corner, and so when we go to interact in that space, we're solely focused right there on only that thing. And I think, in my mind at least, when we read these words to fear God and keep his commandments, that's the whole duty of mankind. What we're seeing here is the book of Ecclesiastes telling us that whatever responsibility we have to anyone or to anything, whatever responsibility we have to anyone or to anything, First and foremost, we have that responsibility to God. And when we realize that everything that we do is filtered through this command to fear God and keep his commandments, it affects the way that we go about our lives. It affects the way that we interact in those little corners of our world. When I'm at work, why do I try to always be ethical, hardworking, honest, and trustworthy. Because first and foremost, I'm fearing God and keeping his commandments. When I'm talking about the relationship with my wife, why is she the most important thing to me on this earth other than my relationship with God and Christ? Why do I treat her with respect and gentleness? Why do I support her and give her a shoulder to cry on and vice versa? Because first and foremost, I fear God and I keep his commandments. And through that filter, those are the actions you take. The same with our relationships with anyone, with our friends or with our parents or with our kids, with the people that we randomly associate with. When we fear God and we keep his commandments as our whole duty, all of the instructions that we've been given up to this point by the preacher, they naturally start to fall into place. If we think of everything that we say and do, first through the, this lens beyond the heaven, or this lens of fearing God and keeping his commandments, perhaps that would alter how we go about life. Perhaps that would make us speak more boldly, more concerned about God's truth than the approval of those around us. Perhaps it would lead us to a life filled with more gentleness, realizing that he has forgiven me and so I, in turn, need to give those who ask me of it the same, ask of me the same forgiveness. It will make us more joyful, more generous, more understanding, more loving. When we fear God and keep his commandments and filter our entire lives through that lens, it makes us more alive the way that God would have us to be alive in the world that he has given us. As we see in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of of wisdom. Fearing the Lord and remembering our Creator makes us wise because it teaches us to live life from our knees. It humbles us as the creatures that we are and exalts God as the Creator who knows what's best. It allows us to navigate life in the midst of the hevel around us, the midst of the fleeting, the troublesome, the confusing, 
It allows us to navigate all of those things and clearly proceed to the home that waits where that perspective is born from. And then our fourth thing that we see here in this conclusion. Again, for one final time, we are seeing that simple wisdom is preparing for the end that is coming. Look at verse 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment, and with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, if you're like me, one of the toughest things in regards to the book of Ecclesiastes is that it tells us that sometimes the things that we consider to be oppressions and injustices, unfair, and the things that are confusing to us in this life, we don't always get the immediate response that we want. We don't always get the immediate action that we think is deserved. We saw that highlighted in chapter 4 and verse 1 when it talks about the action of the oppressors and the oppressed. But then the question would be, so what do we say to that? What do we say to that delay? But maybe the better question is, what should we say to that? What is the book of Ecclesiastes saying to that? And the book of Ecclesiastes is telling us that God will put it right. God is going to put those things right. But at the same time, if we read again the very last sentence of the entire book, the same people that we desire to see judged, the same people that we desire to see brought to account, we better make sure we tighten ourselves up because he's judging everybody. Everything is coming into account. Not just what we perceive to be evil, but what is in fact evil in the eyes of God. And that being the case, the preacher has laid his argument out through these 12 chapters as to the way that we ought to live so we don't fall into that category. So we must be prepared for that day, right? Oftentimes I hear people discuss having a dream that they are going to take a large exam or they're going to a job interview or they have a speech to make and everything's fine. They get there and as soon as they're about to start, they go blank and they find that they're actually not prepared for their task at hand. They wake up in their palms are clammy, their heart is racing. The state of preparation that they thought they had didn't exist. But Ecclesiastes is telling us that there are those who will discover that they aren't prepared for the one and only thing that matters. But sadly, it will not be in a dream. They have spent their life avoiding the reality of the day that is coming, and in doing so, have avoided making the necessary preparations. But for the believer in Christ, for the believer in God, for those heeding the words of this book and the rest of God's revelation, death and judgment are not a point of fear. They are, in fact, a point that we look forward to. This is the brightest spot, in my opinion, of the entire book. When death and judgment arrive, the terror of this world, the hevel that we are in the midst of every day of this world is going to subside. And if we are prepared for that day, it will give way to the glory of the new world which we are waiting for. The glory of the new world which we so desperately want to be in. When I think about this, I look at Isaiah chapter 5. I start in verse 20. I'm just going to read one verse to you. We could read many through this list, but it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And the list there goes on and on. But those things are going to be no more. We're going to an existence that none of those things exist, and that is the reason that this preparation that we've been talking about is so key. 
And I find it interesting that all along we've been mentioning that one of the things of this life that Ecclesiastes wants us to know is that this life is gift from God and not gain. And because of that, I really enjoy looking at what Paul has to say in Philippians 1 and 21 when he says, to live is for Christ, to die is gain. The gain is the gift of the life that comes with the death that we are prepping for. The death and judgment to follow our time under the sun are the two fixed points in our life, the two certainties. They are the very things that by prepping for them allow us the perspective we've mentioned from the beginning of being beyond the hevel. And they will transform the life we have to a life well lived. That's all I have for you tonight. Again, I'm very appreciative of you being here this quarter. I've mentioned to some of you some of the material that I sourced for the class. If anybody wants to know any of that, just please come find me and talk to me. I will be happy to talk to you about any of that. I hope you enjoy whichever class you pick next quarter. Everyone have a good night, and we'll see you on Sunday.
Good evening, everyone. The first song we'll sing this evening is Thank You, Lord. We'll sing through the verse, and then through the chorus, and then we'll repeat the chorus again. The verse and the chorus. For all that you've done. the sentiment of that song is um, the sentiment that we share in this church family on a regular basis. We have so much that is so good that we get to celebrate and rejoice on a continual basis here. And for that we are indeed very grateful to our good God. We think about that tonight as we rejoice with uh, Rochelle Edwards and the birth of her healthy baby boy earlier this morning. A picture of that uh, fine young man is on the announcement slides tonight. And we rejoice with the fact that after our service tonight, in about 10 minutes, there's going to be a baptism. And so if you'd like to stay and be a part of that and witness that, it will take place about 10 minutes after the end of our assembly tonight. Somebody that Kieran Murphy has been close to and studying with, and so we rejoice with that as well. We have much to be grateful and thankful for, much to rejoice about. There are, however, times when we have uh, some particular challenges for people who are very close to us, and we have a couple of those to mention to you tonight. In the email this afternoon, we mentioned the fact that Linda Hines has been hospitalized in Corpus Christi. Ray and Linda, of course, were members of this church family for close to 30 years. Ray served as an elder with us, a shepherd with us for over 20 years. And they moved to Corpus Christi just uh, three or four months ago to be close to their son, Mark. They live actually with Mark and Melanie. And last night, Linda was taken to the hospital with uh, pneumonia, but she actually went into cardiac arrest. She was revived, but she is in very, very serious condition. She's in the intensive care unit, and the outcome of this is yet to be determined, but she is extraordinarily ill tonight. And so that family asked that we pray. Talked with both Mark and Melanie this afternoon, and they ask especially that our church family remember to pray for them, and especially for Ray as he, of course, has been a full-time caregiver for Linda for the past uh, many, many months. And obviously, this is very challenging for him. We also want to mention to you, we're very happy to have Larry and Vanessa McKinney with us tonight. And Vanessa has been diagnosed with breast cancer, and she's going through treatment for that. And we want to pray that that will go well also. But then there's one other matter that I want to mention to you. Some of, uh, <clears throat> some of you are aware of this. Last fall in our church family, we had Jordan Schaus, who was with us. And Jordan is an amazing young preacher. He 
preaches for the Campbell Road Church in Dallas, Texas. He preaches there with my friend uh, Ricky Jenkins. Roger's, or Ricky, Jordan's mom and dad, Roger and Debbie Schaus, are two of my closest friends in this world. I've known Jordan his entire life, known him from since he was just a little, little boy. He was with us last fall, did such an amazing job in preaching the gospel. He's been with the University Church for the past three or four years on this upcoming weekend for their teen weekend. It was scheduled to be with them again this weekend. On Monday, Jordan had some testing that revealed a very, very large mass in his, uh, on his colon. He'll de- learn tomorrow whether or not it is malignant. It is suspected, of course, that it is. And he's been scheduled for surgery on this Friday. And so we certainly want to pray for Jordan and for his family. Jordan's only 35 years old. He has three very small children. And so obviously this is, this is an extraordinarily challenging time for all of that good family. So we think tonight about Linda and about Vanessa and about Jordan. And I'm going to ask that we just, we just stop here and let's pray for them for just a moment tonight before we conclude our service. Can we do that together? Our Father, it is in fact true that we have so much to celebrate and rejoice about. In this place, you've brought together a collection of people who are blessed far beyond what we are worthy. We're grateful to you, dear God, for every way that you bless and touch our lives. We're also grateful that we can pray to you, that we can bring names to you and know that you hear and that you care. We pray tonight, dear God, for Linda Hines, Ray and Linda, who mean so much to our church family. And we pray, holy God, that your will be done in the case of Linda's life. We know that she is in that in-between place now between life and death. And we pray your will to be done because you, O God, know what is best. We pray your comfort to be with Ray especially and with Mark and with Jamie. Bless and keep their family, we pray. We pray for Vanessa McKinney and the treatments that she's receiving and we pray that they'll be beneficial and that they will bring cure to her. We pray for Jordan tonight, this wonderful young man that you've endued with such amazing abilities. He has such a good family, such a wonderful wife, Holly, for his three small children. We pray, holy God, that the difficulty that has been found will in fact be benign. We pray that if it is not, that it will be able to be treated. We ask for your providential care and your keeping. We pray for your guidance. And we pray tonight that you would calm troubled hearts. We pray, Father, for the family of Greg Gravitt, a gospel preacher who was killed this past week in an accident in Birmingham. We pray that you would comfort and keep his family, the lives that he's touched through the preaching of the gospel, the many who care about him. We pray that you would bless and keep and comfort them as well. We thank you that you hear our prayers. We are a people who believe in prayer. We are grateful that Jesus intercedes on our behalf. There are times that we don't know what to say, and we simply ask the Holy Spirit to intercede and to speak with words that we cannot utter. But you understand, as we so often sing, would you listen to our hearts? We pray to you tonight in Jesus' name, and amen. Thank you. Just a couple of other housekeeping things to remind us of. Sunday afternoon at 5, we begin a new teaching quarter. We appreciate so very much all who've taught for the past three months. It takes an army of teachers and volunteers to man our classes, and you all do it so beautifully, so well, and it's so much appreciated. So we begin four new adult classes on Sunday afternoon, and we'll, we'll send out another email before the end of the week, along with the synopsis that we're in the Family Report Sunday, so as you can think about what you'd like to be involved in. And then also we want to remind you of the work day this Saturday. We do a spring cleanup day just before the lectures each year, and that's this Saturday. It will begin about 8 to 8.30 in the morning. We hope you can help us with that. Primarily it will be outside work, although Glenn does say that there will be a good bit of inside work to be done as well. So if you can't work outside, not comfortable with that, there will be work to be done inside, and we'd appreciate your help. And then Glenn would like to particularly ask that on Friday afternoon about 5, 
if you, uh, particularly a young man, if you could help him distribute the bags of mulch around this, the, the grounds, it would be very, very helpful in, in anticipation of Saturday. And when he comes Saturday, he says, if you have a shovel, bring a shovel. Don't know who we're going to bury, but he wants you to bring a shovel. And that will help us on Saturday morning. So you all are always so good about that. We always have so many folks, and we appreciate that much. And then finally, there's a key that was found in the parking lot. So I'm assuming this belongs to somebody, maybe a student, maybe. It's a Toyota. It's a Toyota key. And on the top, it has got the nastiest, ugliest, rustiest key fob chain that I've ever seen. I will buy you a new key chain. It's yours. Is this yours? I will buy you a new key chain. Because you should not have to carry this. It's your spare. You shouldn't even have a spare that looks this bad. All right. Good to see everybody tonight. Sunday's coming. We look forward to seeing you then. Let's stand, sing the song. We'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to learn your word and worship in songs. We are thankful for your son Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. We pray, Lord, those who are sick or lost, their loved ones in our church family, give them your comfort in their needs. Also, Lord, we remember Sister Linda Hines, who is admitted in the hospital for cardiac arrest. God, please give her full recovery and ask your guidance and wisdom for the doctors to choose the right decision in their treatment. Also, we pray for Sister Venisa, Brother Jordan, to get their right treatment and speedy recovery. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in our hearts and minds, that the word we have learned today would be a blessing to us, and please help us to apply them in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for all the wonderful Bible teachers and leadership team in our church family. Please bless them in all their efforts on preparing Bible study and guide us in the spiritual way. We pray, Lord, for your guidance as we leave this place 
and be with us until we return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.